What's up, guys? This year, boy, Barca boy, 103. Today, we're going to be doing the match analysis from the match yesterday between Villarreal and Barcelona, where Barcelona walk away with an emphatic scoreline win of 5 to 1, despite the frailties, the potential slip ups, and also the performance overall in this game. We will also be discussing five key things that we did learn from this match that hope we can implement on a positive and maybe even a negative side to improve the squad overall in the games to come now before we get into it make sure you guys smash that like button down below let's try to get the 200 likes in this video be very much appreciated also if you're new make sure to subscribe down below if you haven't already and let's get into it now, before we get into this video, this video is sponsored by Mi Carrera. Mi Carrera is a platform where you can invest in football players by buying shares in them, similar to buying stocks in the financial market. This means you can buy and sell shares in players you believe had the potential to increase in value. Now, the value of the player's shares go up and down depending on how many people want to buy or sell those shares, not based on the performances in matches. Mika Data also has other key features as well, like real-time market, player trading, seasonal events like for the World Cup, Euros, and Copa America, and community voting as well, where you can vote on the next player's stocks to be joined on the market. Now, have you ever been sure that a footballer will become successful? Well, now is your time to put your money where your mouth is and invest in players to prove to everyone that you have the ball knowledge that's needed in football. So what are you waiting for? Hit the top link in the description down below and check out Mi Carrera and invest your stocks in certain players today. Now the first thing that we learned from this match is of course the risk of Hansi Flick's high line that he does like to play. We'll talk about the pros and cons of that. Before we get into it though, let's take a look at the team's performance overall from a numbers and analysis perspective. The team overall got a 7.29 SOFA score rating. You can see there uh, that we have the team lined up in game. Of course, you could say it was more so of a throw 4 3 3 with Pedri and Pablo Torre as the interiors. We did see, of course, Pablo Torre shift a lot in the number 10 position with him, of course, Lamine Yamal, Rafinha, and Jules Kunde alongside Lewandowski gain the highest rated uh, in the squad of course Pedri there and Inigo and Martinez still there with strong performances as well now you can see on your screen also the average positioning of the Barcelona players at the course of the 90 minutes on the left hand side is the starting lineup and this is the issue that I'm starting to have a little bit which hopefully Hansi Flick will address and you can see right what you can see on the screen those four just hovering over each other like no tomorrow now of course Lewandowski he is dropping back a lot to help with the build-up play so I will discredit him I'm more focused on Pedri, Paulo Torre and Rafinha now of course Rafinha did play in the 10 for the last 20 minutes that will have a little bit of an influence but you're basically playing three like-minded players in the same area and this is where of course roles and responsibility and instruction will become important but them being in the same area does not really bode well for Barcelona especially when you want to have your attacks uh be uh different kind of versatility not more so narrow all the time but again maybe in this game based on the passes of play based on adaptation that's why the positionings were a bit more closer than expected you can see on the right hand side with the um substitutions being integrated you can see that about victor holding the left hand side casado in the midfield Cobarza playing in defense but also keep your eyes by the way on that high line as well you can see on the left hand side where inigo and sergi dominguez are and you can see on the right hand side how that progressed once those substitutions were made some risky play there from Hansi Flick for sure. Now in the match, Barcelona had 64% of the possession, a 4.08 XG, so scoring five, of course, that means we overshot. Uh, eight big chances, 17 shots. Uh, there were three goalkeeper saves in total, three quarter six, 17 fouls, 610 passes, 15 tackles, 10 free kicks, and one yellow card as well. You can see the shots graphic there on the in the middle of the screen right there. Uh, a lot of them coming in from various areas, it's really more so from distance, of course. Of course, Pablo Torre did score from that area as well 17 shots with 10 being on target two hitting the Whitwork, four on to our four shots off target uh three 
eight being blocked, 14 inside the box, and three outside the box. And you can also see on the right hand side there the heat concentration for this match where the play was mostly uh, for Barcelona. You can see they're pretty even a lot on that left hand side, especially in the middle of the park, but attacking wise, mainly down the middle. And of course, right hand side where Lewandowski and Lemon Yamal are going to be. We had three big chances in this match, five big chances missed, uh, three through balls, 33 touches in our opponent's penalty area, and also three fouls in the final third to top it all off. And you can see here now on the left hand side the concentration in regards to where the play was mainly spent and you can see 42% was spent in the middle of the park and 32% in the Villarreal defensive third. Now that's going, of course, a good positive sign. We saw in the Monaco game uh, during midweek that the possession was more so in Barcelona's final third, which of course isn't a good thing. Barcelona had 555 accurate passes of the 610 passes that we did, uh, you know, uh, commit in total. Uh, 11 throw-ins, uh, final third entries about 39 as well. You can see that the crosses as well, five out of seven completed. In terms of duels one, it was very, very even, but it did, of course, edge a little bit to Villarreal's side. And you can also see there how Barcelona did win 73% of their tackles. Now, I do want to bring in now the tactical board just to assess how Hansi Flick did approach the game with his high line. And again, the issue is where there's were those main balls over the top. Now, you can see here, this is how it was pretty much set up. You had Inigo and Dominguez, especially off position, basically touching the halfway line. You had Kunde and Jordan Martin as the fullbacks, very, very wide. Uh, Kunde was a bit more narrow in these areas. You saw Eric Garcia drop in here a lot with Palo Torre coming in here, covering these areas and Pedri here. That's why in that silver score lineup, you could have seen more so of a 4-3-3. Uh, three, three. Uh, now, to just bring the ball in here, just to give you guys a bit of perspective, for example. So when these through balls are coming in here, for example, from the three the out players over the top here the issue is is that both Inigo and Dominguez are having trouble covering this space and also another issue that we did see a lot was Gerard Martin and also Dominguez as well being the inexperienced they are holding the line now Kunde did it well of course then the um I believe it was the Pepe goal scored in the second half Kunde almost kept them onside but again the through balls were really getting this team over the top and again with Kunde and Dominguez struggling in these areas as well we saw Pepe coming through here a lot we saw Ayozi Perez getting behind in these areas as well and the issue is it's such risky play from Hansi Flick especially when these players for example when you're playing in a back four of Gerard Martin Inigo, Dominguez, and Kunde, and you have one and two inexperienced slash young players, it is risky play. And even when Barcelona were getting done on the over the top as well, uh, scoring the goals that end up you know being ruled out for offside, Hansi Flick kept on insisting with it. You can see that with both sides. You can see that as a pro, being that you know what, sticking to his philosophy, sticking to what he knows is best, fine. But then a con, not being able to adapt when your team is clearly struggling. Um, again, it was a really, really risky play from Hansi Flick and again if he does this on a continuous basis I promise you teams will find us out so there's two ways of fixing this well number one to either just go balls to the walls and just keep the line even higher than it already is to really catch out you know uh, counterattacks and other teams and secondly if, aside from perfe uh, perfecting it adapting to it maybe saying okay we've gotten to we've gone two nil up let's now hold bring the line a bit further back let's control the game a bit more than maybe when we have a bit of the momentum shifting our way we can shift the line back up immediately to comply with how the game is playing and that can easily be done here on the sideline by Hansi Flick as well so these little things here that Hansi Flick that I think should be adapting to especially when you can visibly see the team struggling in game it is risky play but as the way that Hansi Flick wants to approach the matches now, the second thing that Barcelona did learn in this match is that they will be without their starting goalkeeper and captain for the rest of the season in marked Andre Ter Stegen. It looked like a knee dislocation during the game. ACL is not quite confirmed. What is confirmed is that Ter Stegen will have a long period of time on the sideline. As of uploading this video, the club should have already confirmed what injury Ter Stegen has officially suffered. But what's not, what's pretty much is official as of recording this video is the length. Best case scenario, he might come back for the last month of the season, but a very, very unlikely scenario is that he will be out for the rest of the year. If there was a summer tournament, let's say, for example, coming up, like the Euros, World Cup, Ter Stegen might rush himself back a little bit, especially with Neuer retiring, him being the first uh, Germany goalkeeper. But with there being nothing this uh, coming summer, it looks like Ter Stegen will be out for the rest of the season. It is it does suck. It is unfortunate. I understand that his uh, form has been piss poor this season, but you never want to, you never wish injury upon a player. Um... I will say this though, will I miss Ter Stegen? I, 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 I don't know. I don't think I will because again, his performances over the past year have been shocking. Again, you could argue that we don't have a suitable replacement, all that sort of stuff, but 
that's besides the point. This is on a human level, and you know, he's going to be on the sideline for quite some time now, suffering through this injury. Apparently, it's to the knee where he had his operations in 2020 and 2021 as well. So that right knee just might be shot now, beyond belief. He might not even, there is, I would say, a bit of a small chance he might not even come back. He might be forced to retire as well because he already had two surgeries on that knee, uh, I believe, after Anfield and then after Bayern A2 as well. So. He's already been shot in that knee a couple of times, so this is not going to be boring well. And also, what's worse as well is that when he was leaving the hospital yesterday following the match, he was leaving in a wheelchair, which means that he can't put any weight on it whatsoever, which means that it won't be an ACL because we've seen, you know, Gavi, Bernal over the past few years, how they, when they leave, they do leave on crutches. They do be able to put some weight on it a little bit, but Ter Sagan can't even put anything on it whatsoever. You'll see here in a second him getting up and trying to get into the car. You can see uh, how he was struggling as well to get in there. Like... It is as worse as you can get. So we will be without Ter Stegen for the rest of the season. Um, not having your captain as well. We'll probably see, you know, the likes of Aruho and Frankie when they come back sharing the arm bed. Of course, Rafinha will be there as well until they come back from their injury. And the question is, what are Barcelona going to do in the goalkeeper position? I will say this. I have to transmit calmness and relaxation. I'm seeing people saying, oh, sign a free agent. Oh, let's do this. Let's all do that. Until January hits. We should not be focusing on the goalkeeper position. Now, in terms of signing someone, we can, of course, use her second salary like we did with the, with, with the Aruho and Christensen. We can remove him from the salary um, wage bill in terms of FFP since he will be out injured for more than three months. I believe that's the threshold. Three months or four months, something like that. So, uh, signing a goalkeeper will not be an issue, but there is... A situation that we have to discuss, and that is the one of Inaki Pena. This man has the lifeline of the most luckiest person in the world. Last season, Ter Stegen got injured, and Akipendo was given an opportunity for three months to prove himself. Is he good enough to be a, a second choice goalkeeper, a starting choice goalkeeper, or neither? He proved to me and a lot of the Barcelona fans that he's neither. My God, was he shite beyond belief last season. Absolutely failed his test, piss poor. He's not been given another bone. He's been given another lifeline. I think what the club will do is, of course, we have... I don't. The club would not sign a free agent goalkeeper. I'm seeing people say, "Oh, bring in Kayla Navas, uh, get Szczesny out of retirement." Oh, uh, Jordi Masip, the former personal goalkeeper, is a free agent. Blah blah blah. No, what the club are gonna do, and what I agree with as well. You gotta trust Anaki Pena until January. See how he does. If he does crap as well, you maybe you can panic and go sign a free agent in the next two or three weeks. Maybe during an international break in October or November. Um, but you have to give him a runabout. You have to give him the opportunity. You know, he's been patient. He's been giving his time. You also kind of, you know, low-key want to renew his contract as well. It's fair to give him a runabout. If he does well, cool. Maybe he can survive the rest of the season without, you know, panic signing a goalkeeper. Maybe go for a proper goalkeeper in the summer like we already should have done when Nutter Stegen was injured or fit. If he flops uh, a, a lot, maybe sign someone immediately. If he flops a little bit, you can wait until January. Of course, the main thing that's come about a lot is um, Vai, the uh, Las Palmas goalkeeper who's now out of their project, he'll be a free agent in 2025, but maybe for a couple million, two, three million, you can get him out of Las Palmas uh, in January. He's a fantastic goalkeeper. He won the best goalkeepers in La Liga last season, but now since he's not renewing his contract with Las Palmas, he has been kind of frozen out of their project. So he could be a great option come January, but until then, we're going to be sticking out with Naki Pena. And again, I've never seen a player at Barcelona get two chances, and... It's up to him to take it. I mean, he didn't concede when he came on to the pitch. He made a great save, uh, point blank from Nicolas Pepe in that second half. Conceded, I think, twice, but both of them were all sided in the end. But listen, I made it very clear last season that I don't rate Anaki Pena. I think Asher Laga is better. I think Arnaud Tenez is better. But he's, you know what? We have to give him another run about and we'll see how he does. Of course, we got Bayern Munich game coming up, Classicals as well. Uh, big games in the Champions League where we need to, you know, pick up results. So. He's going to have a mission and a half to really prove the fan base wrong and, you know, to show everyone how good of a goalkeeper he really is. But again, in, term, in terms of signing replacements for Ter Stegen, it'll have to wait till January. The club will not panic and go for a free agent. They will fully trust Inaki Pena as we knew about this in the summer. Remember, Inaki Pena wanted to leave in the summer and the club had to sit and convince him to stay and be the number two for Ter Stegen. So he will not, we're not going to go and sign a free agent. We might someone sign someone in January if Inaki Pena is that crap and the fan base and the Kule is associated she's really get onto the board and the uh, journalists you know help us with that then definitely for sure but in the summer going with position now is going to be a top one top two priority for sure so we'll see how things turn down in that regard again speedy and healthy recovery to Ter Stegen who will most likely be out for the rest of the season we'll wait for the official confirmation from Barcelona later on today without our first team captain for the rest of the season and wait and see how the situation in regards to the goalkeeper position does develop over the next few weeks
Now the third thing that we did learn from this match is that Pablo Torre can be trusted. We saw him now get his first chance of the season and how well he did perform during that chance. Got an 8.3 server score rating. You can see from his heat map there, mainly occupying it as a 10 and also a right interior. In the match, played an hour, got one goal, one assist, 46 touches, 85% pass accuracy, but only misplaced five passes. Two key passes, he kept the one cross, completed it, he had the two long balls, completed one of them, created one big chance as well, he took the two dribbles, completed one, he won half his ground duels, he also was fouled twice and committed one foul. What Tore showed us in this game is that he has the ability we've seen it we've known it this is why we invested a lot of money in a youngster like him from sporting as well he has the quality we saw in preseason how well he did and he is the perfect ideal replacement for Denny Almo of course since Fermin Lopez is out injured so you could say the ideal replacement for both Denny Almo and Fermin Lopez I much rather see him in the 10 than Pedri I think Pedri works better as the interior for the system same with Rafinha as well I think he works better on the left I mentioned this already over the past few weeks discussing the Fermin Lopez and Dini Almo absence and I think we can all agree that Palatore is the perfect option and he's shown it and this also again is a little testament to Hans Lievik as well and onto why he should have brought him on earlier against Monaco midweek could have changed the game for sure his ability on the ball movement vision is what you want in a 10 he just needs more time more trust and i hope and pray that hansi flick does give it to him because after this cameo and this match against villarreal he definitely deserves it now the fourth thing that we did learn from this match is the reliability consistency and confidence of Jules Kunde. Again, he's gone under the radar a lot over the past few weeks after starting the game against Vidalin since he scored, but we all know how good Jules Kunde has been, especially since the turn of the year in January 2024. He has been nothing short of sublime since coming back from that injury that he did have last season against Osasuna when he was out for about a month, month and a half. He was sensational, and this again is another perfect example of that game. You can see here he got 7.8 sub score rating. You can see from his heat map as well, mainly playing as the fullback, but spent a lot of time more so in the Villarreal final third than he did in the Barcelona defensive third. In the match, he played 90 minutes. He attempted one dribble and completed it. Didn't get a goal or assist in this game, unfortunately, but had four clearances, one block shot, one interception, one tackle, was not dribbled past the entire game. He attempted four ground duels and completed three of them. Only lost position eight times. He was fouled once and did not commit a foul. 95 touches, 93% pass accuracy, only misplacing four passes. He had two key passes. He attended two long balls, completed both of them. He also attended four crosses, completed half of them, and he created one big chance. I have to highlight this, by the way. He attended one dribble, was not dribble pass once in this game, and did not commit a foul. The, uh, there is no other defender in the world, in my opinion, that has the capabilities and, a, and a, you know consistency to do this on a regular basis for a defender. Was not dribble pass, did not commit a foul. He is Mr. Reliable, Mr. Consistent, and he does this week in and week out. And we saw the crossing stats, the final third stats from Kunde, how, what, how well and high they were in this game. It's just now down to the tone and effectiveness of those abilities. We know that Kunde is a top defender. In that first half, he saved us on numerous amount of occasions. I'm surprised that there wasn't any aerial duels that he won or attempted there because I remember him doing lots of headed clearances at the far post during that game. But the quality of Jules Kunde is second to none in the world of football. Every single team would take him. I think honestly, as a defensive player, whether you play him at right back or center back, I genuinely think he walks into basically every team in the world. I may, you know, maybe Arsenal, they just like the partnership of Saliba and Gabriel, but I personally believe that Kunde is better than Gabriel. I think he's better than uh, Timber and uh, Ben White. You look at Real Madrid as well. Carvajal is more of a balanced fullback. I understand that, but if you compare him to Rudiger and Militao, I think Kunde is, you know, on par with both. I would even suggest that he's better than Militao. I think Rudiger has been really on fine form recently. I think there's a strong argument there. Uh, look at Bayern Munich, pff, definitely walks in easily. I'm trying to think of Man City. I think at right back, if you want to have more defensive uh, capabilities, I think, of course, Kyle Walker is better going forward. He has that speed, but I think Kunde as a defender is much better. I think he's better than Akanji as well. This is the defender that we have in our hands, and this is why I'm so glad that Barcelona did not panic sell him this past summer, and we have someone here to rely upon, not only for the rest of the season, but the, for the next few years. He's now shoring up his game. He's now adapting well to the fullback position. Again, the crosses, the runs in the final third, the dribbles are there, just now down to the you know fine-tuned detail execution. 
position. Once that's sorted out, he will be not only a brilliant defender at the back, but also a brilliant defender going forward as well. And the fifth and final thing that we did learn from this match is that the mindset of Rafinha is only thinking about what is best for Barcelona. And in this match, it was quite evident of that. Now, in this match, he did have an 8.6 sofa score rating. You can see from his heat map there, basically all over the final third of Barcelona, whether it be in the middle, on the left, a bit even on the right as well. In the match, he played 90 minutes, scored two goals, had an XG of 1.26, uh, had five shots on target. He did the four dribbles, completed three. Uh, he had missed two big chances, 58 touches, 79% pass accuracy. Two key passes, he lost position 14 times, was fouled once, did not commit a foul, dribbled past twice, one tackle, and two clearances. Apart from losing possession quite a little bit, again with a winger like that, you do expect, you know, in the region I would say of 8 to 16, somewhere around there, so it is a bit on the higher threshold uh, point of view. Apart from that, it is a very comfortable performance. Now, I didn't mention, of course, in the match review, how I don't think Rafinha was decisive, did not, you know, progress the ball forward well, and I do agree with that. Of course, the stats numbers will overshadow what you can see with the eye test. But the one thing about Rafinha in this game that he showed that was at the highest level is his mentality. Hansi Flick came out post-match as well, highlighting not only the ability, but also the care and the love that Rafinha has for this team and for this club. Rafinha also came out for the game saying that he loves being the Barcelona captain. He's a Barcelona fan growing up. This is nothing short of his dream. And with now Ter Stegen, Arujo, Frankie all out, he will be the one leading the team out and wearing the armband on a consistent basis. We are, of course, expecting Frankie Young to come back in the next two or three weeks. But if he doesn't come back, Arujo is not coming back until December, uh, Gavi until maybe January. And of course, Ter Stegen is out for the rest of the year. So he's going to be the one leading this team. This has now become his team. He's already kind of been the captain on the pitches. He has to do the talking with the referees since Ter Stegen is all the way back in goal. He needs to take this moment now and lead this team and guide it. We see how upset he is after games when we when we don't get the results. We saw, of course, the post last season from the PSG game, the picture of him sitting on the uh, on the stairs after the Monaco game as well. He cares. But the most important thing for him is to lead this team and don't get too emotional. Don't let your emotions get the better of you, especially in games. And also, keep up with the performances. We're seeing now over the past two games, the Rafinha from last season, you know, performing well, uh, progressing the ball well, but a bit indecisive in the final third. Of course, he scored two goals yesterday. I understand that, but one of them, you know, deflected, another one was just, you know, magical from the Yamal mainly, but the most important thing there is he's finishing his chance. We saw, of course, in the first half, him missing a big chance that he shot with his left foot because he's more so right-footed, so with his weak foot, the sharpness wasn't quite there, so he is still improving, and that is the scary part. He's, you know, has five goals this season, uh, I think three or four assists as well in six games. He has 10 uh, GAs in six games. That is a sublime record for a player like him. He needs to continue it, but also the fact that he has room to improve shows the ceiling of this player. And that captain's arm bend, from his perspective, might give him the edge to become the player that we all know he can be and reach his peak ceiling. So that was a match analysis from the match yesterday between Villarreal and Barcelona. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, of course, make sure you drop a like down below. And of course, in the comments down below as well, let me know your thoughts on everything we discussed on the high line. Do you think it's an issue or not? What would you do in regards to the goalkeeping position long term for the rest of the season? And your thoughts on those key performances that we did highlight as well. And of course, make sure you guys subscribe down below if you haven't already and i will see you guys next time on the channel take care and force a barca